Trude, in nomine Patri et Filius et Spiritus Sancte. Amen. The year of 1066 saw an event which changed the direction of England forever. We all know the Battle of Hastings, but do we truly know what unfolded on the morning of the 14th of October, 1066 AD? In this video I will be discussing what happened during the battle and dispelling some common myths and rumours based on the evidence that we have. Firstly, we will begin by briefly describing the three main characters in the lead up to the Norman invasion and the Battle of Hastings. Harold Hadrada, King of the Nordics, commonly known as the Vikings, however the term Viking relates to a job role such as a pirate or marauder. The general name for these people from places such as Norway and Sweden were the Norse, not the Vikings. It is worth noting that these Norsemen were not necessarily an invading force by this point, as they had established large swathes of land throughout the British Isles for hundreds of years by this point, including a considerable amount of the mainland. William of Normandy the Normans being descendants of the Viking raiders who plundered Paris in 845 AD and were subsequently given lands in nowadays northern France in return for peace with the Franks who owned Paris at the time. And then Harold Godwinson, leader of the Anglo-Saxons. Despite common belief, he had not been King of England for long. He was crowned King of England on January the 6th, 1066, after King Edward died the previous day. Edward had no living children, so no direct lineage with a crown could pass to. Harold, being a very prominent and influential warlord in England at this time, with close ties to Edward, was deemed the suitable heir to the throne. However, Edward had already promised the throne to William of Normandy, who offered to remove the Nordic threat from English soil, in exchange for the crown to be passed to him once Edward dies. There were many more factors at play, but it would take too long to discuss in depth, so for the purpose of this video, we will keep it simple with a summary of our three main characters. Harold Hadrada of the Norsemen, who had established control in much of England by this time, and intended to have the entirety of the British Isles under his reign. William of Normandy, who also wanted to expand his kingdom, and was promised the crown of England in exchange for protection from the Vikings. And then Harold Godwinson of the Saxons, the new king of Anglo-Saxon England, who was chosen by his predecessor, King Edward, tasked to get rid of the Vikings and the Norman threats. On the evening of the 25th of September, the Saxon army, under the banner of Harold Godwinson, were celebrating a heroic victory over the Vikings at Stamford Bridge. The victory at Stamford Bridge proved to be the decisive battle to end the Nordic reign over England, and, had Godwinson won Hastings as well, it would have left him in a strong place to push the remaining Nordic people out of England and seize control of much, if not all, of the British Isles as his kingdom under one Saxon rule. The Saxon celebrations, however, were cut short, as on the 27th of September, a messenger delivered news that the Norman fleet had finally landed on the shores near Pevensey on the South English coast, being delayed by bad winds. And so, the tired and bloodied Saxon warriors again picked up their spears and axes, strapped their shields on their backs, and began the long march south to confront the Norman invaders. It is mentioned in historic accounts that William, Duke of Normandy, along with his men, witnessed Haley's Comet roaring across the sky and took this as a good omen, a sign from God that he was destined to be victorious but we can instantly dismiss this because the Saxon army would have looked up at the same sky and saw the same comet, and would have also thought that this was a good omen from God, since both the Saxons and the Normans believed in Christianity during this time. Both armies agreed to meet in an area known rather strangely as the Field with the Grey Apple Tree. Harold Godwinson arrives at a field which cascades down a hill, and decides that this will be the place where he makes his stand. William, standing on the other side of a grassland on top of a hill, looks down at the battlefield and begins planning his attack. The night before the battle, chroniclers mention that William and the Norman soldiers spent the night deep in prayer, however the Saxons could be heard drinking and laughing, roaring like animals. It should of course be said that the chronicler in question was a Norman, 
so the details of this would be taken with a large pinch of salt. Slightly more believable, were the records of William being cautious that the Saxons would conduct a raid on the Norman camp in the middle of the night, so he ordered a portion of his troops to stay awake and guide throughout the hours of darkness. On the morning of the 14th of October, 1066, both armies arose from their slumber, adorning their armour and sharpening their swords one last time before battle. The Saxon army had got the high ground, and were the defending force, so they locked their shields together in a shield wall along the steep ridge of the field. We should also note that due to Harold's lack of horses and archers, he would have been forced to hold a defensive role in the battle anyway, as the Normans had over 2,000 horsemen and a few more thousand archers who had their flanks protected by thick marshland, so going on the offensive and splitting up units would be far too dangerous for the Saxons to do. Regardless, the Normans would have been forced to charge uphill, faced with a wall of shields and spears, no easy task for any invading force. Legend has it that the battle began with a solitary soldier on the Norman side, named Taliepha, who, according to chronicles written much later, was singing and juggling his sword, and agreed to fight a Saxon warrior in single combat first, who he killed then proceeded to charge at the Saxon lines on his own, killing a further four Saxon soldiers before being engulfed and cut down. We cannot know if this event truly did take place, or perhaps just an embellishment of the truth, but we do know that the battle formally began at around 9am with a volley of arrows from the Norman archers. The archers proved not to be very effective, as they had to shoot uphill, which simply hit into the Saxon shield wall. They could not aim their bows to fire in an arc, raining down on the Saxons' heads, as this would mean getting closer to the Saxon line, and the Saxons had many slingers within their ranks who could easily just run out, sniping the archers, and they had proved to be very accurate at short range. The Norman infantry advanced, climbing up the hill under a barrage of Francisca throwing axes, spears, javelins, stones, and arrows. After an initial clash of melee combat, the Norman infantry proved ineffective at breaking through the Saxon lines, and were beaten back. William sent a portion of his cavalry to harry the infantry, hoping to break through, but the steep incline, coupled with the dense formation of the battle-hardened Saxon Huskars on the front line, meant that the Norman cavalry could also not break through, and were forced to retreat and regroup. As the Normans regrouped, the injured and tired Huskars on the front line fell back, being replaced with the fresh, eager warriors from the ranks behind, renewing the shield wall for another attack. The Normans attempted again and again to break through the Saxon lines. The fighting carried on for hours, with more and more warriors on both sides beginning to fall in the bloody mess. The Duke of Normandy himself got involved in the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, having his horse slain from underneath him at one point, which sent rumours through the Norman ranks that their king may have also been slain. It is not certain whether the retreat that followed this event was genuine or not, as an organised false retreat, called a feint, was a known military tactic at this time. But, nevertheless, the Normans began to rout, retreating down the hill. Parts of the Saxon front line started to follow, believing the battle to be in their favour and wanting to hunt down the retreating Normans. Chroniclers say that to prove William was not dead, he jumped upon another steed, galloping amongst his men as he removed his helmet, showing the soldiers that he was still alive and well. At this, the Normans halted their retreat and returned to the fight. The Saxons, evidently caught out by this sudden change of events, found themselves split up, with the shield wall now in fragments. Merciless fighting ensued, as the final hours of the battle drew closer. The mounted Norman knights charged through the separated Saxon ranks, harassing the Huskars as well as cutting down the less armoured farmers, peasants and countrymen who had taken up arms to join the Saxon cause in order to protect their lands and homes. At this point, something occurred which moved the battle into the realms of legend. It is said that Harold Godwinson was shot in the eye by an arrow, which killed him and confirmed the defeat of the Saxons on this day. But what is the actual evidence for this event? 
The earliest Norman accounts of the conquest do not mention this at all. William of Poitiers mentioned the king himself and his brothers, and not a few of the nobles of the kingdom had perished. William of Jumer wrote that Harold himself was slain, pierced with mortal wounds during his first assault. It is only until around 1080 AD, in the History of the Normans, written by Amartus, a monk in an Italian abbey of Monte Cassino, we read that Harold's eye was gouged out by an arrow. Over in England, William of Malmesbury and Henry of Huntingdon further mentioned that an arrow in the eye wounded Harold. However, go on to state that he was then cut down by Norman knights. But remember that these accounts were writing in the early 12th century, now an entire generation after the battle occurred. One surviving piece of evidence, contemporary to the time of Hastings, is the Bayer Tapestry, which claims to clearly show a soldier, most likely Harold, holding the shaft of an arrow which is lodged in his eye. This would be fairly conclusive evidence, however we know that this segment of the tapestry was prepared in 1842, and historians now think that the figure may have been originally holding a spear, rather than an arrow as other spear-wielding figures were stitched standing in the same stance. When looking upon the tapestry, you'll see the inscription, Harold Rex, Interfectus Est. King Harold has been killed. And here we see another figure being cut down by a mounted Norman knight. These figures would conform with the 12th century English text advising that Harold had first been shot by an arrow, and then later killed by the approaching Normans. This would be a much more believable death for Harold, as it depicts a king who was shot by one of the many arrows raining down on the Saxon ranks at the time, then dragged to the back of the lines by his protection of Huskars, only to be butchered by the Norman knights who managed to break through the Saxon lines. We also know that Harold was slaughtered so brutally that, after the battle, his body could only be identified by his mistress, Edith Swanneck, who managed to identify him by intimate marks on his body. So why were the initial Norman accounts so vague when discussing how Harold died? Well, it may have been because the Normans prided themselves on the practice of chivalry. As such, brutally cutting down an already injured nobleman, let alone a king, would bring shame upon the Norman king who allowed this to happen. So, William may have sworn his chroniclers to silence, censoring the details to retain his honour, which would surely grant him better favour as the new King of England. In summary, we cannot know for certain exactly how Harold Godwinson died. We know that it is likely he was injured by an arrow, perhaps in the eye, perhaps not, as this would have been extremely common on a battlefield like this. But we also know that arrows rarely killed people on their own, at least not instantly, as one could carry on fighting while pierced with multiple arrows. So it is likely that Harold's bodyguards attempted to remove him from the battlefield, but were overwhelmed and cut down by the advancing Norman forces, and in the heat of battle, Harold was killed. In the aftermath of the battle, William rallied his troops, marched on to London, and on Christmas Day, 1066, he was crowned the new King of England, officially placing England under Norman rule. I'll let you decide what you think truly happened on this day of 1066 AD, but I hope that this information provided today has helped educate you on your understanding of the events that occurred. For now, thanks for watching.